In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for your love for every one of us. Thank you for the interest you have in every soul present here. We bless your name for the grace that has brought us into your kingdom already. We know you are watching over every one of us. We are praying, O oh Lord, as you have desired that we get to heaven on the final day, we ourselves will have that same desire, and nothing will stop us in Jesus' name. Your grace is sufficient for us. Your love is abundant for us. Your power cannot fail in keeping us. But we need to hold on to the Lord. Increase our faith, O oh Lord. Increase our commitment, O oh Lord. Help us so that none of us will look back. We are praying that that place we are prepared for us, we shall not miss it in Jesus' name. As you have sent your message for us to be where and to take heed, we will take heed in Jesus' name. We pray that we will not exchange the eternal life you have given us for anything in this world. That final day we know that our joy will know no bound. Help us that will endure to the very end. Keep us by your grace, by your power. As we study today, O oh Lord, we pray that these words will be written upon the tables of our hearts. Give us power as we study the word. The power to remain faithful to the very end. In Jesus' name we pray. Today our study brings us to Hebrews chapter 12 from verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 It says looking diligently lest any man fail of the grace of God Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you And thereby many be defiled Lest there be any fornicator or profane person as is
One muscle of meat sold is birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. These three verses are important verses for every child of God, everyone that has the grace of God in his life, to re-examine and to think about, to so meditate upon it, that the very blessing of the verses will remain in our lives. It's sounding a note of warning. And you know if there were no danger, there will be no warning. There are some Christian sectors, there, is, uh, there are some Christian groups who feel there is no danger of backsliding for any child of God. Such groups of Christians fail to see the lesson and the study in the study that we are looking at today. Already we have learned in verse 14 where it says, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And you will see this has been addressed to Christians, to the people that already know the Lord. These verses we have read today, they are still sounding, in fact, blowing a trumpet of warning that everybody will take it, everybody will hear. From the beginning of the epistle itself, you find there are warnings being given to everyone. Warnings come to unbelievers and warnings come to believers. Look at a few of the warnings we have in the epistle to the Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 2 verse 1. Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things we have had, lest then at any time we should let it sleep. And then he tells us in verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? That is talking to unbelievers. There is a warning there for the unbelievers that if they reject, if they neglect so great salvation, how will they escape the judgment of the Lord? Look at chapter 3 verse 12. Take it, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. This warning is addressed to those who are brethren, those who know the Lord, and it says, brethren, you should take it, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in leaving the Lord, straying away from the Lord, backsliding, departing from the living God. In chapter 4, verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. You will see there again, it's warning both for believers and unbelievers. There is a rest abiding, there is a rest waiting, there is a joy waiting at the end of the road. And then he says, you should take it, lest you come short of that rest that is prepared and preserved for you. In chapter 4 verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fail after the same example of unbelief. You see there is telling us, if we do not take heed, if we do not watch our steps, we may fail, we may fall, and then we will not be able to enter the rest as prepared for us. In chapter 3 verse 6, But Christ, as a son over his house, whose house we are, if, there is a condition, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. If you are a sincere child of God and you read those verses sincerely, you will know that these verses are telling us there is danger and therefore there is warning and therefore he tells you to beware, he tells you to take it so you will not fail, so you will not fall, so you will not miss the crown on the end. God is telling us today in the passage we are looking at from uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and in verse 15. It says we must look diligently lest any man fail. Actually you will see there are three times in this short passage he uses the words lest any. Look at it in verse 15 looking diligently number one now. Lest any man fail of the grace of God. Look at it again in verse 15, looking diligently, number 2, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Then as you look at the end of verse 15, there is no full stop, that means there is still a continuation, and it means that it is still connected with the looking diligently. So you have number 3, looking diligently, then in verse 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one muscle of me sold his birthright. 
is warning us against backsliding. But he's telling us something more than backsliding. And there are three steps he traces for us. He says, number one, there is backsliding. Number two, after that backsliding, there's degeneration. Number three, there is apostasy after the backsliding and degeneration. Then that person comes to a point of no return that he cannot come back to the Lord again. And he uses the example of Esau to tell us that there is a possibility of backsliding. There's a possibility to go from backsliding and go so low you become degenerate and reprobate and rejected. And then to come to the final end, which is supposed to see that you even want to come back and there's no chance again to come back. He tells us that pitiable condition in verse 17, For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, even though he sought it carefully with tears. We want to diligently study what we have before us today, devoting each point to each verse. We're going to look at number one, exhortation against backsliding. Then number two, Esau's sale of his birthright. And then number three, examples of losing eternal blessings. Point number one, exhortation against backsliding. Here is the word of the Lord for everyone already in the kingdom of God. For the people who are born again. For the people who are children of God. Because as you read this epistle to the Hebrews, you will not fail to notice that it is written to believers. And you know that these verses we are looking at, they are not verses that we are reading for unbelievers. They are for us, those who are members of the household of faith. If you are a child of God, you are the one that the apostle is calling on to his side. Look diligently, lest any of you believers will fail of the grace of God. I want you to see that the epistle is written to believers. So there will be no doubt in your mind. These are warnings against backsliding for those who are already children of God. Look at Hebrews chapter 3 verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Those are believers. They are brethren. They are holy brethren. They are partakers of the heavenly calling. Chapter 3 verse 12 Take heed brethren Those are believers Those are members of the family of God Those are the brothers and sisters in Christ He says take heed brethren, brothers and sisters Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief In departing, in straying away, in leaving, in forsaking the living God In chapter 6 and in verse 9 he says, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we don't speak. You know, he's talking to believers, he called them be the beloved. And he even said, we are persuaded of better things of you. And he's full of expectation that they will have the things that follow, the things that accompany, the things that are subsequent to salvation. They were saved already. In chapter 12, I'm reading from verse 6. He calls these people, the people that God delights in, for whom the Lord loveth, he chastineth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. He's referring to them as the children of God, sons and daughters of God. Do you see then that the exhortation against backsliding is directed at believers? And look at verse 15 of chapter 12, looking diligently. It says you are not to be careless in your Christian life. He says we are not to take the grace of God for granted. He says we are not to say, I am saved, I am saved. Therefore, there is no reason to be diligent, to be careful, and to be watchful in my life. We must be looking diligently. He says if you don't look diligently, do you know any of you can fail of the grace of God? He's talking to the people that have already got the grace, the grace of God in their lives. And he says, keep that grace of God. Embrace that grace of God. Let that grace of God continue to operate and walk in your life. And keep on living and looking diligently so that you will not fail of that grace of God you have received. 
And he said, backsliding does not stop at just leaving the Lord and failing of the grace of God. He says, once that happens, be careful now, because lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. You know the tree, and you know branches, and you know the root. The branches are visible to be seen because they are external. But the root is hidden underground. And the apostle is saying, look diligently, so that a root, a hidden root, a hidden selfishness, a hidden kind of murmuring and complaining and backsliding, departing from the Lord, does not start underground, and then it will spring up, and then other others will see it eventually, they will even be defiled. Moses, the man of God in the Old Testament, had warned the children of Israel against the same thing. Deuteronomy chapter 29 verse 18. Deuteronomy 29 verse 18. Lest there should be among you man or woman or family or tribe whose heart turneth away from the, this day from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root that beareth gall or wormwood. You see, he's talking of something that starts in a very imperceptible manner, in a very hidden manner, in a very secret way. He says, whose heart turneth away from the Lord our God. That sliding starts in the heart. It starts with murmuring in the heart, complaining in the heart, finding fault of the Lord in the heart, giving excuses in the heart concerning the commandment of God, expressing being fed up and discouraged and not interested again. It starts in the heart, questioning the goodness of God and the love of God in the heart, turning away his eyes and turning away his face and turning away his trust and confidence in the heart from the Lord. Secretly thinking there is salvation in another apart from Jesus Christ. Secretly feeling that the whole answer, all the answers are not in the Bible. There may be an answer in another place. Secretly thinking about that in the heart. Secretly feeling that the grace of God is not enough. The power of God is not enough. Depending upon the promises of God is not enough. And turning away from the Lord in the heart. And turning to another thing. The person will still be coming to church. He'll still be mixing with the other believers. But every time the word of God is coming out, in the heart there is a questioning, there is a murmuring, there is a doubting, there is a rejection of the word of God in the heart. And sin as all they always say, uh, depend upon the promise of God. Look up to the Lord and you need to get to heaven. They talk about holiness. In the heart there is a rejection of the word of God. There is a root of bitterness already. Bitterness against God who has not fulfilled feel all the promises I'm claiming and bitterness against the church of the living God who are not uh, taking care of me as I want them to take care of me. Bitterness against even ourselves. Why did I even become a Christian? Why did I put myself in this situation? Why am I with these people of God? The bitterness that is hidden in the heart eventually it will spring up and then everybody will know that you have gone, you are backsliding. In Hebrews chapter 12 verse 15 He's telling us that that sin eventually will come up. Lest any root of bitterness springing up. It says it will shoot out. It will become manifest and evident. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. We cannot cover it up permanently. Backsliding in heart will eventually be visible and manifest as backsliding in life, in expression, in tongue, in communication, in everything that we do. As it springs up, it will trouble you. And then he even says, Thereby many be defiled. He's telling us uh, the truth we already have learned in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Backsliding, a member of the family will soon affect, if the other members of the family are not careful, it will soon affect the other members of the family. Worldliness in the wife, in the woman, if, if uh, the family is not careful, it will soon affect the daughters, it will soon affect the children, it will soon affect the whole family. 
murmuring and complaining from the husband, from the uh, from the leader, the head of the home. Uh, coordinator is not good. Church is not good. The doctrine is too hard. Heaven, heaven, every time. That murmuring and complaining coming up from the father, coming up from the head of that family. If we're not careful, it will soon affect all the members of the family. Once the heart of uh, one of the members of the family is uh, shifted away from the Lord and has departed from the Lord, and he goes to double into whether it is a, a candle or incense or whatever it is that they are doing now, because their heart is no more on the bare promise of the word of God. That will soon affect the members of the family. He says, and thereby many will be defiled. In Second Peter chapter 2 verse 2. Second Peter chapter 2 verse 2. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. When a big tree falls in the forest, it falls on other trees, and those other trees are destroyed. And when somebody will have been looking up to when he backslides, when somebody will have been looking up to when he begins to complain against the word of God, when somebody will have trusted, and somebody will have, will have appreciated, and somebody that has been encouraging us, when he backslides, when he says, that's enough for me, I don't want to continue like that, holiness, holiness is too much, I want to go and take care of the things of the world. When a person like that, when he backslides, many other younger people are, they are disappointed, and they will be destroyed. In First Corinthians chapter fifteen, please turn the cassette over. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. If you think now I'm strong, they cannot influence me. The grace of God is abundant in me, no backslider can influence me. I'm holding on to the promises of God, I'm so firm in my conviction, no backslider can defile me. Whatever they say, whatever they tell me, and whatever complain, I can hear all their murmuring, I can hear all their complaining, I can hear all their gossips, I can hear them, everything they are saying against the church, and against the doctrines of the Bible, I can hear everything, it will not affect me. That's what some people said before you. They said, I, I believe on the Lord. That's what they said before you. They said, I knew the Lord before I married that woman. That's what they said before you. They said, I knew the Lord before I married this person. They, I knew the Lord before this person even became born again. Whatever he is doing, it will never affect me. I will stand till the end. Today they have been affected. Today they are backsliding. Today they are degenerated. Today they are almost in apostasy. 
if you are too intimate with the people that do not know the Lord, or with the people that knew the Lord before, but they are backslidden, and you are listening to their words, and you are listening to their murmuring, and you are listening to their jesting of the doctrine of holiness, and you are listening to the defilement in their lives, eventually you are going to be influenced. Many will be defiled. Eventually you begin to believe a lie. Eventually you'll be doubting the word of God. Eventually you too will be saying, but it is true. This thing that these people are saying, why is it that uh, we are only emphasizing holiness and we are not emphasizing deliverance? Eventually you'll be justifying them. Ah, I can't blame them, oh, well, although they are backsliding, although they are not totally in the world. But uh, the way they have explained to me, I can't blame them at all. Already you will agree with them and you will be against God. That's why we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 12. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Are you born again? Take heed lest you fall. You have strong conviction in the word of God? Take heed lest you fall. Are you saying I know myself? I know the day I was born again. And I know my conviction, I know my consecration. Nobody brought me here, nobody can drive me away. The Lord appeared to me directly like he appeared to Paul. I am so convinced that nobody can change my mind. Other people have said that before you. Wherefore, let him that thinketh his standeth, take heed, lest he fall. And so he tells us in Hebrews chapter 12. And now he gives us an example. And it is the example of Esau. In uh, chapter 12 and verse 16. He says, lest any man, lest uh, there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who sold, who for one muscle of me sold his birthright. Now you see here, he brings in fornication and he brings in profanity. He is not telling us that uh, that's exactly what happened to Esau, but he's bringing a similarity between fornication and what Esau did, between profanity, profaneness, and what Esau did. What uh, did Esau do? Look at his story in Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25 from verse 29. Genesis 25, 29. Here we read the story of Esau and Jacob's third portage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. Do you realize there are times you'll be tired? There are times you'll be hungry? There are times your body will feel in need? There are times you think you cannot take another step? There are times you think you have come to the end of the road? And it says at such a time, remember Esau. He came from the field, and then he was faint. And Esau said unto Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with the same red pottage, uh, that uh, for I am paid, therefore was his name called Edom. At this time, the need of his body was the only thing he was thinking about. The hunger, the fainting, was the only thing that appealed to him. The need of the present hour, the need of the present moment was the only thing he singled out. He never knew about tomorrow. He never thought about the future. All he wanted to satisfy and to gratify was the pleasure and the demand of today. You see, when the temptation to fornication comes, the person that is being tempted to fornication is not thinking of tomorrow. It's not thinking of the shame. It's not thinking of the judgment. It's not thinking of eternity. It's thinking of the need of the body right now. He will only be thinking of the gratification of the flesh. He will not be thinking of the salvation of the soul. He will not be thinking of the eternal blessing for the redeemed. He is only thinking of the present need of the hour. That's why the fornicator is likened unto Esau. And then when a person becomes a profane person, that means he becomes an earthly minded person, not thinking of the spiritual, not thinking about heaven, not thinking about the grace of God, not thinking about the anointing of God upon his life, not thinking about his birthright, not thinking about his eternal inheritance, only about the present need of today. That's a profane person. That's why it's likened to Esau. In verse 31, and Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. Oh, you want pottage? Sell me your birthright. You want to gratify the flesh? I'll give you, but sell me the birthright. 
you want to solve the problem of the hour, the problem of the day, oh, I'll help you solve that. Sell me your birthright. You don't have any patience to go to the kitchen yourself and spend one hour and wait one hour and be patient for one hour and prepare something yourself. You want something ready made right now? Sell me your birthright. When somebody is not thinking about the future, about eternity, he will not think that the price is pain. To have something from the world and have something from the devil, that that price is too high. Look at the price that Esau was paying for a single meal. He was going to give up his birthright, not for the food that will feed him for the rest of his life, not for the food that will feed him for one month, not for the food that will feed him for a whole day, for a single meal to just satisfy his hunger, he was willing to give up the birthright. What a price he paid! In verse, in verse 34, then Jacob gave his bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and, he dr and drink, and rose up, and he went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Anytime you are hungry, please remember there is something at stake. Anytime your flesh, if you are a man, your flesh is saying, I can't do without a woman, I can't do without a woman, let me get a woman somewhere. Remember, eternity is at stake. And woman, I can't wait again. This resolution they are talking about. Uh, I, I must see a man now. If I don't get a man now, I don't know what I will do. I need a man immediately. Remember, eternity is at stake. There are times that some earthly needs, some personal needs, some fleshly needs will become so exaggerated, we forget salvation, we forget eternal life, we forget eternity, we forget the things of God, we forget what we have got already, and we forget that we are very near eternity now, and you may sell your mouth right like that, you may never find it again. What makes some people backslide? There are some simple, very simple things. Uh, they disciplined me unjustly, therefore we forget eternity, we forget eternal life. I, 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 I throw their salvation to them. Even that salvation, I don't want it again. Even that church, I don't want it again. Be very careful. Because of the dissatisfaction and the problem of a day, you want to lose eternity. I spoke to that sister, I said, you are the will of God for me, can I marry you? And the way she replied me, I am going to even teach her a lesson, I will go and marry a non-believer. I will lose that salvation, I will kick away that salvation, I will marry a non-believer, whatever will happen, let it happen. You are selling eternal life, because of marriage, you will cry for eternity. And then what you have done, I will teach her a lesson, the person you are teaching a lesson may get to heaven, and you spend eternity in hellfire. Whenever there is any problem that if the devil is making you to say, leave the church, leave that salvation, leave the Bible, leave eternal life, and uh, damn the consequence, remember, he knows what's ahead of you. He is wanting you to sell your birthright because of a need of the moment, a need of the hour. Be patient and stay where you are, even if the hunger is there, even if the barrenness is there, even if the joblessness is there, even if the lack of education is there, even if the the need of your life is there. Wait for the Lord and leave everything in the hands of the Lord because of eternity, because of your soul. In Mark chapter 8 verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What did it profit Esau? That he gained that pottage, a meal of a time, of a period, of a single meal, and then he lost the birthright. What shall it profit a man, even if he becomes the most popular in the city, in the state, in the nation, in the continent, and he loses his own soul? What shall it profit you if you marry Miss Nigeria, and then you lose, you lose your own soul? Marry the richest man in town, and then you lose your own soul. Get a job by giving bribe, get a job by giving your body into immorality, and then you lose your own soul. In verse 37, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? There are many people today that run after the material things of the world, and then they lose their souls. In First Timothy chapter 6, reading from verse 9 and verse 10. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and awful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. For the love of money is the root of all evil. 
the love of money that will not allow us to have quiet time in the morning is the root of all evil. The love of money that will make us to seek work and go to a place where there is no Bible, a place where there is no sound teaching, a place where we cannot have the fellowship of the brethren, but I've been looking for work. This is the only work I get now. I cannot say because of salvation, because of church, I will not take the work. I've been looking for it for a long time. The love of money is the root of all evil. How many people in search for money? They go here, they go there, they go to various places, and they leave their wives here in uh, in the city, and then in the places they go while they are looking for money, uh, the result is that they fall into temptation over there. Salvation is gone. The knowledge of the word of God is done is gone. By the time they come back, they are completely empty. There is no more salvation again. You can see it on the face of the man. He went for money. Maybe he got money, but he he lost something greater than money. Where are you today? For the love of money is the root of all evil. Which one of some coveted after they have erred from the faith? They were in the faith before. They were born again before. They have erred from the faith. They have pierced themselves with, through with many sorrows. Like you saw, they left spiritual riches and they went after carnal pleasure. They lost their salvation because they were looking for physical gratification of the flesh. They were more concerned about the satisfaction of the body than their soul. As lastly, comfort was exaggerated in their mind more than heavenly consolation. And what they can have today, what they can get in this life, that was of more importance to them than the approval of God for their lives. That's why the epistle to the Hebrews chapter 12 is warning us. He says, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. And then he says, lest there be any fornicator, any profane person as Esau, who for one muscle of meat sold this birthright. The sea would have inherited the blessing, but you could not. You know that he was uh, the firstborn of Isaac. The blessing God had given to Abraham passed on to Isaac, and the blessing should have passed on to Esau. He had sold the birthright, that's why it went to Jacob. Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer, would have come through the line of Esau, but he had sold his birthright, so Christ came through the line of Jacob. The God of heaven would have been called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Esau, but no, he had sold his birthright. It's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Through Esau, all the families of the earth should have been blessed, but no, he has sold his birthright. It is not through Abraham to Isaac and to Jacob that now all the families of the earth have been blessed in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The very gates of the new Jerusalem, now twelve of them, they are marked with the twelve tribes of Israel. Israel is Jacob. All those gates should have been marked with the sons of Esau. He had sold his birthright. It went on to Jacob. The everlasting covenant that God had made with Israel, He will gather them all over again from all the earth. That everlasting covenant should have been made with Esau. He had sold his birthright. The everlasting covenant is now attached to Jacob to Israel. He lost it because of one meal. He lost it because of what he put in his mouth. He lost it because of the gratification of the flesh. What are you trying to lose? What are you trying to despise? Because of food, because of money, because of the material things of this world. In uh, Hebrews chapter 12 verse 17. It says, For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected. For he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. He realized it too late. He had sold it before he knew the value of what he sold. He gave it away and gave it all before he knew the importance and the eternal value of what he had given away. When he realized how valuable the blessing was, when he realized all the things that are associated and attached unto that blessing, unto the birthright, he ran after that thing again, wanted to get it again, it was too late. He sought it carefully with tears. He cried bitterly. It was too late, he couldn't have it again. You know there are some backsliders like that. They backslide for a moment of time. After that backsliding, they realize, what have I done? I am empty now. I am dry now. And there is no, there is no grace of God in me again. Their eyes open all of a sudden. 
What have I gained with this fornication now? What have I gained with this adultery now? This useless money that is in my hand, I don't even want it again. What am I going to do with this money? They look back to the things they have left. They look back to the things they have lost. And for some of them, they are not really able to come back to where they, they were before. And that's why the word, the word of God is warning us that we should be very, very careful so that we do not lose what the Lord has given unto us. It was not Esau alone. There were some other people in Bible days. You remember Balaam? He was a prophet of God. He prayed a great prayer. Look at it in Numbers chapter 23. And in verse 10, how Balaam prayed a prayer. And he said in verse 10, who can count the dust of Jacob and number the fourth part of Israel. Let me die the death of the righteous and let my last end be like his. Already he was on the wrong territory. He was in the wrong place. He had given up the way of the Lord. He looked at Israel. He looked at the beauty of holiness. And he looked at the end of the righteous. He said, oh Lord, can I retrace my step? Can I die the death of the righteous? And my life's end will be like the end of the righteous. He died a sinner. He's crying in hellfire right now. He wanted it, he couldn't get it. You know, it is like that for some people. While the Lord is still talking to them, they will not take care. When they have lost it, it's when they will be seeking for it again. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 10. For demons has forsaken me, having loved this present world. He that's a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Demas was once a child of God. He was once a fellow worker, fellow laborer with Paul the Apostle. He was once a beloved brother, a devoted worker. But the world began to appeal to him. He began to see some beauty in the world. He began to feel, why have we left all these things behind and we're just going about a missionary journey? He backslid in his heart first. After that, he said, eh, I'm sorry, Paul, eh, you can take that crown, you can take that heaven, you can take that glory alone by yourself. I think we're missing something in the world. I think I need to go back into the world. Are there not people like demons today who were serving the Lord with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength? And even unbelievers knew that they were totally devoted to God. It was like they had a vow of the Nazar of the Nazarene Nazarite upon them. But today they have gone back into the world. Today they cannot pray. Today there are no tears of repentance. Today there is no joy of salvation. They are forsaking the people of God. They are forsaking some doctrine. They have gone back into this present world. What a pity for them. And the trumpet will soon sound. Where will they be? They know the story. They know the doctrine. They know the warning. They knew the joy before. They used to think about the coming of the Lord with joy. Now whenever they hear that the Lord is coming, sorrow will fill their heart. One of these days, we will be gone. They will not see us again. They may even run to this church. The church will be empty. They will not hear anybody to preach to them. They will kneel down on the, on the bench there. They will try to pray like they used to pray when they were here. But the unction is no more here. The anointing will no more be there. The Holy Spirit will not be on the benches. They will try, they will call upon the Lord. Oh Lord, can you not give me a second chance? And the Lord will not even answer at all. They will cry like Esau. But there will be no answer. And then their heart will be dry. They come out from that gate there. They meet the messengers of the Antichrist. They say, where is your mark? Where is your mark? And then they take the mark. And they are lost forever. And Jesus said unto the people, He said, remember Lord's wife? The angels took their hand. Come out of this place. Because we are going to destroy this place. And he took hold of their hands. He drew Lot out. He drew the daughters out. He drew the wife out. The wife was saved. The wife was rescued. The wife was to go to the mountain top. The wife was to inherit eternal blessing. Don't look back. Danger is behind you. Fire is coming upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember Lord's wife? And she began to think. 
of the jewelry in the world. She began to think of the social parties in the world. She began to think of all the things they led. And she looked back, and she looked back, and she looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Jesus said, and Jesus said, and so shall it be at the time when the Son of Man shall come. And he says, remember, he says, remember, don't ever forget in your life. At the time when temptation comes, don't forget, remember Lord's wife. Have you been saved? Have you come out of the world? Have you come out of Sodom and Gomorrah? Remember, remember, remember Lord's wife. Will you be with us in heaven? Will you be with us in eternity? Will you escape completely the world? The Lord is calling upon you today. Don't look back. Don't look back. It will not be long. The trumpet will sound. It will not be long. Our Savior will come. It will not be long. We will leave this valley and the shadow of death. It will not be long. We will leave all this place of temptation. It will not be long. The trial will be over. It will not be long. The joblessness will be over. It will not be long. The barrenness will be over. It will not be long. All the problems will be over. Remember Lord's wife? Don't look back. Call upon the name of the Lord and say, Lord, I want to be there. I want to be there. I know you are preparing a kingdom. I will be there on that day. Why don't you rise up and say, Lord, count me among your people. Count me among your people. Count me among your people. Don't let me perish in this place. Don't let me die in this place. Don't let me perish with the Sodomites. Don't let me look back. I am weak. I am not strong. But your grace is sufficient for me. You can hold my hand. The temptation is, is on my life. The trial is there. The discouragement is there. The people of the world are calling me. My flesh is pulling me. My relatives are calling me. But oh Lord, help me. Hold my hand. Don't let me fall. Don't let me look back. Always, when the temptation comes, always, when the trial comes, always, when the problems are there, remember Lord's wife. And remember Esau. For just one moment, he sold his birthright. He wanted it again. It was too late.